Hey everybody, welcome to episode 52 of the Go Get Outside podcast. This is your host, Jason Milligan. Welcome back. Welcome aboard. On today's show, we will be speaking to Eric Johnson, a.k.a. EJ Law. He is an attorney, former freestyle skier, backcountry skier, canyoneer, mountaineer. He and I recorded this at a park in El Segundo near the airport back in May of this year, roughly two years after an infamous event that forever changed his life. And on today's show, while we will be speaking a fair amount about lawyering and skiing and even canyoneering, we will spend even more time talking about the innumerable injuries that EJ has experienced throughout his life and how he's dealt with everything from broken bones to amnesia to the irreparable harm that occurred on May 9th, 2015 in Peppermint Creek. So be prepared. This episode runs the gamut, ranging from grim to hopeful to gory, but constantly doused in the utmost sincerity. And before we get started, I just want to give a very special thanks to Eric for sharing everything he shares in this episode and being so open and honest about everything you're about to hear about. Eric Johnson, 35, attorney, general outdoor extreme enthusiast, former freestyle skier, blended into backcountry skiing, ski touring, then I got into canyoneering, blended with skiing, turned into mountaineering. That's really why I spend most of my time working, (laughs) so I can do those things. So how'd you get started in skiing, and also... How does being a lawyer fold into all of this? That's a question I ask myself every day. Skiing, my dad was in National Ski Patrol for 10 years. He was a very accomplished skier, especially for the time he grew up in. I grew up skiing and surfing. My dad taught me both of those at a really young age. And I grew up in the 80s when snowboarding really started getting popular. But because my dad was a purist, he never let me snowboard. The rule was I could only snowboard when I could outski my dad, which was never supposed to happen. In junior high, I started rollerblading because it was also the early 90s. Were you also into grunge music maybe at the same time? I was for a brief second, but then it it very quickly transitioned into ska and punk rock. (laughs) So so were you rollerblading with a flannel shirt on? I was. Just setting the stage for everybody. This was just actually a little bit after the grunge movement. So that was like, grunge was 93, 94, 95. So this is post-Cobain death? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is really like 96 through 99. So I started doing my skate tricks on skis, which at that time was unprecedented. Twin tip skis, skis that flip up on both ends, didn't even exist at that time. So I actually made my first pair of twin tip skis by making this small black shovel that I riveted onto the back of my skis so I could land switch. Right as I was doing the stuff that didn't exist, the whole new school skiing thing blew up and twin tip skis came out and skiing started to become cool again. So I kind of jumped on that bandwagon and tried to ride it out as far as I could. Another reason why I got really into skiing, because at the time we were living in Fresno, which is an awful place to live, but one of the upsides was that we were only an hour away from a small hill right outside of Yosemite. So I could ski all the time. One of the guys at my rival high school, Andy Finch, was the fourth rider on the U.S. snowboard team in the first two Olympics that snowboarding was allowed in the Olympics. So there were actually some really good riders up there. I was riding with some good people. And I was kind of at the forefront of like a brand new industry. 
So that's how I got into it. And that's why I was so into it because I felt like I was among small group of people making skiing cool again. In flannel shirts. <laughs> Not at that time. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, you had moved on from flannel Yeah, shirts. at that time it was a cut-off khakis. So did you grow up in California? Have you always yeah. lived in California? Yeah, well, I was born in Arizona. My parents lived there for like five seconds and then moved back to Orange County. I lived there for 13 years. I was in Fresno for four years. And then I did my last two years of high school in Texas. I got into UC Berkeley for college. (laughs) A factor in going to Berkeley was they had a snowboard team that had a cabin in Tahoe. And I'm still friends with the guy who was the snowboard team captain to this day. I chose to join the snowboard team, not the ski team, because the ski team only raced. And I was doing freestyle. I was doing half pipe and slope style. And big air. Were you skiing better than your dad at this point? At this point, yeah. So it's okay <laughs> that you were on the snowboard? Yeah. You were well, able to tell him about they it? They did not really like me skiing, but it was when I started getting injured that it really became a problem, which happened pretty quickly. <laughs> God, in the four years I was at Cal, I broke my leg, tore both tendons in my thumbs, broke my tailbone, three concussions got airlifted across state lines to a brain trauma unit in Washoe, Nevada. So, so how did these injuries come about? So tearing your tendons is actually so common that they call it skier's thumb. When you're holding your poles, your thumb's exposed. So if you fall, your thumb's out and you'll just pop your thumb back. That actually happened in the last injury I had. It's not uncommon. I broke my leg beginning of freshman year trying a new trick at the end of the season, a reverse Misty Flip 720. I over-rotated slightly and my skis just scissored and snapped my leg. Tailbone, I (laughs) bounced off the top of a jump, completely cleared the transition and landed in pike position down at the bottom. (laughs) I remember, (laughs) I distinctly remember this because it was a female ski patrol who came up to me to ask me if I was okay and I said to her, I'm going to shit my pants, and there is literally nothing I can do to stop it. It literally felt like a bomb went off in my ass. It hurts so bad. So did you shit your pants? I didn't. I thought I did, but I didn't. (laughs) So I literally knocked the shit out of myself, but I I didn't. And you immediately uh, got a date from that ski patrol woman, right? That was a horrible experience. The most serious was I had a string of concussions really bad. Every one of them, I knocked myself out and had a seizure, so they were pretty serious. The first one was happening in a photo shoot at this uh, pretty famous road gap. It's a jump over a road above Donner Lake in Tahoe. I did that, didn't quite make a rotation, caught an edge and just smack. Then four weeks later, I was trying to compete in a big air contest. I have almost no recollection of that day at all. I had amnesia after that, ended up having to take the semester off for a medical withdrawal. Went back, finished college. Uh, The next year, I knocked myself out. I actually landed on my feet. I just overshot the jump a little bit, had a real hard landing, but I didn't actually even hit my head. But at that point, my brain was so sort of sensitive just the jostling within my skull was enough to knock me out have a seizure as this was happening my family was freaking out it caused a lot of drama tried to make a conscious decision to back off a little bit at the time i had a girlfriend and i was in the process of graduating then applying for law school the good thing about all those injuries is they give you a lot of time to practice law (laughs) yeah (laughs) so i tried to make a deliberate attempt to kind of back off go in a different direction. Uh, Went to law school three years, hated my life. Going from Berkeley to Pepperdine was a huge culture shock. I mean, (laughs) you literally could not have more diametrically opposed experiences. So I went to law school, hated it. I graduated in 2008, which was pretty much the height of the mortgage collapse. So all the jobs dried up, it was pretty rough. I always knew I wanted to start my own business anyway. After bouncing around a little bit in a very volatile legal market, I decided to just go ahead and start my own firm. So I bought a bunch of books on it, read a ton about it, did that. Uh, There was one point I was working three jobs at a time and I wasn't even getting home until probably 12. Starting over, doing it again, 6 a.m. the next morning. Finally, 
got to the point where my own practice was self-sustaining, which is really where I wanted to get. Once that happened, I started to realize the skiing wasn't just this like youthful fad in my life, like playing soccer or baseball or whatever. It was something I really needed, just being outdoors itself. And skiing was a thing. I, if, if I had continued growing up in Orange County, surfing might have been the thing. But skiing was my thing. I was really good at it, and I loved it. I wanted to get back to it, so I slowly started getting back into it. Slowly started to get into backcountry skiing, which is a completely different animal. It is almost an entirely different sport. So I gradually started getting into that. Around that same time, there's a lot of really cool backcountry stuff, like rappelling into couloirs and stuff like that. I did a little bit of bouldering in college, but I never did much climbing, mainly because I was a broke college student and already had an expensive hobby. Also, always kind of a maverick, and I just wanted to do things when I wanted to do them on my own time, where climbing you need a partner, so there was just more barriers to entry, so I never really got into climbing. So the whole rope work, making anchors, rappelling, all that stuff, um, I wanted to get skilled in that before I went out and started doing it. So that's when I kind of started looking into canyoneering and I had seen some pictures and I thought, well, that looks fucking cool. I want to do that. I asked around and I got referred to Klaus back when he was solely operating through Meetup. I took one of his courses. Immediately, I was hooked. I was like, well, now I have to do this every weekend during the off season. So that's how it happened. And the two blended together really well because I mean, all the canyoneering skills you learn about how to make anchors on the fly you're going to use in backcountry skiing. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about how backcountry skiing differs from traditional classic skiing. Backcountry skiing, you need like a PhD just to understand what kind of equipment (laughs) you need. The boots are incredibly different, so there's always a trade-off between alpine skiing and hiking. So for backcountry skiing, there's a wide spectrum between something that's going to be really good on the downhill and something that's going to be really good on the uphill. If it's really good on the downhill, you're going to sacrifice uphill. So really good on the uphill, you want something incredibly light, incredibly flexible, which is the exact opposite of what you want for a downhill ski. So you're looking for what you want, what kind of skiing. Are you more interested in hiking up? Are you more interested in climbing? Or are you willing to tow more weight because you're more concerned about performance on the downhill? So boots are one, bindings are another. So Telemark skis with the free heel were the original mountaineering ski. Telemarks have kind of gone the way of the dodo because now they have what are called tech bindings, which is basically a hybrid between a free heel Telemark boot and a downhill ski. The binding allows you a free heel for the hike up, but then it'll switch and you can clamp in so it turns into a downhill binding once you get to the top. It's pretty sweet. Uh, Also really expensive, so it took (laughs) took years just to get basic equipment to go out. And then you need skins. You stretch them over the ski so you can walk uphill and then you take them off storm in your pack and ski down for anybody who's into climbing and everyone's kind of a, a gear geek you can really geek out in gear because there's so much stuff and so much to learn there's no lift right no yeah you, you definitely earn your turns which makes you appreciate them a lot more it's pretty epic being out there and you have a giant face and you're sharing it with no one it's, it's a pretty cool feeling but you really hope you don't fall because then you just blew your whole day <laughs> right there's no there's no one nearby to walk up, watch you shit your pants, and then help bring you back down to the cabin? Unfortunately, no. Earlier when we were talking about skiing, we kind of glossed over two points that I think anyone listening is not going to let me bypass. Okay. So two things I think we should cover, because we almost immediately got into, yeah, I got into skiing, and I got hurt a lot. And you (laughs) cover all these injuries. I think a lot of people are going to say, why the hell would you keep skiing if you just get hurt all the time? So first that, and then the second thing, because you rarely meet a person who has said this, you said, I had amnesia. And you can't say, I had amnesia and just end the conversation there. So you've got to tell us about that as well. So why keep skiing? You mentioned that you got into law and you kind of realized, like, this isn't just a fun thing I did. This is a part of me. I need to do this. So that answers that question to a certain degree. But I think some people would say, well, you got hurt a lot, so why not do something easier? Right. I mean, I I did get hurt, but I got hurt from doing pretty extreme stuff skiing. I mean, my first concussion, I was jumping off a 30-foot rock over a road, and I was also 
competing and trying trying to compete at a basically a pro level. When I returned to skiing, my goal wasn't to try to make it in the X Games. Part of the reason I wanted to get into backcountry skiing because I figured it would be a comparable challenge, but safer, quote quote, than freestyle skiing, park riding. I mean, whether that's true or not, time will time will tell. <laughs> if you look at professional skiers, it, it's a lot like gymnastics. The, the athletes are getting younger and younger and younger, and that's just sort of a body weight mechanics. Kids are stronger proportionally compared to their body weight, and they're more flexible. They have less injuries. They're probably also less aware of <laughs> the consequence of their actions. But typically, skiers will always transition into um, backcountry as they progress in their career. So like Shane McConkey, a lot of other guys. So I kind of figured, well, I'll do the same thing. That's my way of answering why I wanted to get back into it. And then the amnesia, that was weird. So there's this classic idea, which I know is inaccurate, from sitcoms and stuff, where right. somebody wakes up and they say, I don't know who I am. Right. And then they get knocked on the head again at the end of the episode and they remember everything. What was it like for you when you woke up and you didn't know what was going on right so the the first time I got knocked out my first major concussion I got knocked out and I I woke up and I remember (laughs) I remember him asking me uh, what year it was and I remember thinking in my head oh ha ha this is so cliche (laughs) I've seen this in movies I know the answer to this question it's mind blank (laughs) I had no idea what the answer was (laughs) And I, I remember thinking in my head, fuck, <laughs> this is bad. <laughs> um, and, that, and then the next thing they said was, don't move your neck. So I freaked out. I had, I had no idea if I had severed my spinal cord. I, I had, so that was probably one of the scariest moments in my life, other than my most recent accident. So the amnesia one was, it wasn't as cliched as the example where you just... I wasn't like Jason Bourne where I forgot my identity, but I would be going to class. Berkeley's a big campus. I mean, it's almost the size of a city. I would be going to class and end up on the north end of the city, far off campus, and not know where I was and for, and wouldn't remember where I was supposed to be going. I remember I was trying to study for an exam. I was trying to make it through the semester. I studied the whole weekend for, an ex- for this exam. I took the exam I think it was on Monday or Tuesday it was almost like the little guy in my head kept searching I knew that the answer was in my head but I couldn't retrieve it it was it was the weirdest thing like I I saw the answer and I knew I had the information but I I just couldn't get it out It was like my brain wasn't working it was rough head injuries are are weird man physical injuries are kind of self-limiting like you break your leg you try to do something with it ow that hurts so you stop head injuries you have no idea something's wrong yeah there's not a lot you can do about them either right yeah you just have to wait it out how long did that amnesia last so i think this was around like february 2001 and i ended up withdrawing for that semester yeah imagine imagine it was difficult to just keep up with your schoolwork if you yeah that problem there was a lot going on so the only long-term thing I did notice from it was that my so- short-term memory recall was a little impaired. Before it, when we would go off on a tangent on the conversation, I was able to trace my steps back and say, oh, wait, we were talking about this originally. And afterwards, that was the one thing. It would kind of just like like vanish. Mm-hmm. It would vaporize, and I would forget what we were originally talking about. But it wasn't until a couple, couple years ago that I realized that came back, whether I've you know, establish new connections or it came back. Uh, Either way, it's, I noticed that I didn't have that problem anymore, which is awesome. So then it lasted a good decade or so before. The long-term effects were very minor, Mm -hmm. but yeah, it was, it was something that stayed around for a while. So there's my amnesia story. (laughs) (laughs) So despite forgetting many, many things and dealing with amnesia (laughs) and breaking your ass and Almost shitting yourself, but not. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You decided, well, let me get back into this because I can't stand just spending my whole life focusing on law only. The whole lawyer thing, it's it's definitely a very multifaceted psychological thing I question all the time. There are some aspects of my personality that are extremely aligned with being a lawyer, and there are other aspects that I feel are not at all, but then... 
when when I started my own firm, there, there's a there's a very distinct difference between uh, what they call big firm attorneys and solo practitioners. I felt I had kind of made a giant life error for a long time. Like, oh my God, being attorneys, that was a huge mistake. Then I started my own practice and met on the solo practitioners, and I kind of felt like, oh my God, like this is my family. This is where I belong. So I, I do kind of have a love-hate relationship with it, but I also have a love-hate relationship with L.A., and I'm still here. If it's any consolation, I have a love-hate relationship <laughs> with every aspect of my life. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the thing. and Part of it is like, I mean, I, I don't know if I would be truly happy in anything I was doing because if you're really doing it it's work and work is always hard right like I go to the gym and I think I will always go to the gym I'm always gonna work out do I enjoy being there not really it sucks but (laughs) (laughs) I would never not do it would it be awesome to be able to just ski all the time and somehow make a great living doing that yeah but that's not really possible unless you're like one guy and, and even, even and even he then, probably gets sick of it. And, too. and even then, even then, even then, there would be something. I'm glad I have a skill that um, I can do from virtually anywhere, unless I need to be in court. I'm glad that I was able to get to the point where I have I have my own practice that I can manage. I'm not subject to anybody else's restrictions on when I need to be in the office, what I need to wear. I'm kind of master of my own destiny in that respect so all those things i like about law i i do enjoy the intellectual challenge of it for better or worse it drives me crazy but i also find it fascinating i think it makes your mind sharp you're constantly learning new things and questioning things so all those things are good but it's also an extremely stressful uh, (laughs) profession very demanding time consuming well thankfully you use your other time to do less stressful <laughs> well, things like hike up snow covered mountains I, and, and that's <laughs> uh, you know and that's that's part of why i think i ultimately realized i had to get back because i don't think i can sustain that one aspect if there isn't something else balancing it out i, I had a friend recently Yvonne, I'll throw her name out there because we both know her, <laughs> who said she thinks the the one word people would use to describe me is intense. And she didn't say that as a compliment or a uh, an insult. I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> I, I, I don't. I mean, it's, it's, you know, I guess it's all on how I use that. The intensity is going to be coming out somewhere and I, I need to balance my life. Mm-hmm. So I can't have it going only into my career because I'll just I'll burn out. I think that's one of the problems a lot of people face, especially in the U.S., this idea that you are your career. And so people focus just on their career, and then they realize a decade later that they're stressed out, they're miserable, and they have no balance whatsoever in their life. And then those people become terrible, terrible people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And make all of the rest of us pay for their misery. Yeah. So you balance your life out. By getting back into backcountry skiing, which then just made you decide to get into canyoneering right. because you wanted those rope skills, but then you fell in love with canyoneering. So what was it about canyoneering that drew you in? I was kind of like a winter rat. I would love the winter, and I surfed. I was never as into surfing as skiing, and again, that's probably just because it's circumstantial. I moved right in those formative years, and I was closer to the snow than the ocean, so... Because of that, it was always kind of like I would just I would deal with the summer. <laughs> I would I would make do with the time, but I was really just waiting out for the winter. But when I got into canyoneering, I was like, oh my god! Now I have something to keep me totally invested the right. entire year, spring and summer. Yeah, yeah. and the, the sports. Since I was getting into backcountry skiing, they they completely blended together and complemented each other. Really, lots of transferable skills. And it was the whole community. I was, like, immediately exposed to this whole very tightly connected community of like-minded people with similar interests, which is really difficult to find in Los Angeles. I mean, Los Angeles, like I said, I have a love-hate relationship with this place. It is everything it's portrayed to be in social media. It's got the total douchebag appeal. (laughs) But at the same time, it's amazing. We have amazing restaurants. We have the ocean. We have the mountains. We have hills. We have 
everything. But you have to find it. The outdoor sports community isn't this pervasive aspect of society like it would be in Boulder or Denver or somewhere. Yeah, it's kind of folded in because it was the same thing. I moved out of here, I guess, almost 15 years ago now, and I didn't have any idea that the outdoor thing was going to become a major part mm-hmm. of my life. But it's kind of like folded in underneath everything else. And once you find it, you realize there's this enormous network Mm -hmm. and every conceivable thing you want to do is within driving distance. Once you found it, that's the awesome part. Yeah. And once you found it, it's like so easy to just connect all the pieces. But until you know one person or until you know yeah. it's there, it seems like it's non-existent. And for me, that one person was Klaus. When I met that guy, it was like, whoa. Now And then Freddie, who got me on the SoCal Canyoneering Facebook site. And then it was like my whole world opened up. It's like, wow, this is rad. Click of a mouse, I could be doing a canyon with, you know, four new friends. And then I did my first... Well, no. So I did... I think the first, like, wet canyon I did was Vivian Creek. But then it was San Antonio, and that was my first experience at Baldy, which has the ski hut. <laughs> right, you think you would have been there. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, whoa, my, this, my mind just got blown. I was so stoked. I was just eating it up, man. I was trying to get as many canyons under my belt as I could get. For people that don't canyon here, there's, there's like, a big difference between dry canyons and wet canyons. There's... Yeah. Similar experiences, but then drastically different in yeah. other ways. So if you went into your first wet one, what was that like? Did that change your concept of what you could do? Anybody listening to this is probably not going to be surprised at all. So I have ADHD. I was diagnosed at a very young age, and that's a whole other psychological, weird psychological thing. It's commonly misunderstood. People um, assume... Uh, especially in children, that this this hyperactivity is the result of having an excess of something. Like, I have excess energy, so therefore I'm hyper hyperactive. But it's actually kind of the reverse. Um, it's linked to a, a lower dopamine count. So for the same activity, I have a lower level of stimulation, meaning I require more stimulation in order to have that same normal like stasis. Doing a wet canyon is just like this convergence of everything you're repelling and the water's going by the cliff you see your friends above the water splashing below i mean it's just it's insane and the more powerful the water the more intense the experience which you know anyone who's done a serious wet canyon it's pretty overwhelming spectacular so the second i did that where you go under the water in a can i mean it's it's amazing and you're out doing stuff uh, in a place where very little people have been So there's the novelty factor, and it's a pretty addicting sport, (laughs) I think, for a lot of people. People get into it real quickly. It it definitely is. Uh, I joined Klaus's meetup early on as well and met a lot of people. Because before that, I I had, like, one buddy that I could do canyons with and joined that meetup. And within a short period of time, there were dozens of people and then more people and then more people. And I constantly see people come in. Some of them disappear, but a lot of them stick around, and it becomes... Like you mentioned, Freddie, it's almost like an obsession <laughs> for him to do canyons nonstop. You went from, you know, skiing, where you hurt yourself a lot, mm-hmm. to backcountry skiing, mm-hmm. where it seems like maybe you've hurt yourself less, which has led you to canyoneering, which is another thing you love, but it's had a big cost. <laughs> yeah. Which I guess now is the time for us to talk about that and what happened there. As I, as I said, I, I kind of slowly got back into skiing after I graduated, but really after I started getting settled in my own firm, getting my feet under me, that became the next piece of my life, trying to get this balance back. I really started getting into backcountry skiing around 2012, 2013. June 2014 is when I took my class with Klaus. The first immediately after that for July 4th, we had a big trip from Hermosa Beach to Vegas to Zion and back. Uh, That was our first like canyoneering trip. That winter, I leased a place with my buddy Kyle, who ended up saving my life, and a friend Stephanie up in Mammoth. I remember at that time I had started canyoneering that year. I had gotten 40 canyons and 40 ski days under my belt which I felt pretty good about for just getting back into it but this was 2014 which was like the shitty ski season on record so that's why the ski season ended kind of early the first canyon of the year was the first week of May we were going up to the sequoias to the goal was to to end up doing lower salmon creek 
with the 600 something foot rappel. It's been a while since I've been looking at canyons right, because so, I've been so out up, of the. So then, upper salmon. Is, upper, it, yeah, is upper, upper salmon, salmon the 600 foot wall? Upper salmon's going with the big uh, wall. Okay. And lower salmon, I can tell you, you don't want to run right now because we tried to do it last weekend and it was. Oh, it your was pictures white water. that I saw. Well, that was Freddie's pictures, but okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> if you asked me two years ago, I knew every every detail of every canyon beta out there. I've kind of had to deliberately not look at it the last <laughs> couple of years because it's been it's been rough. There were four of us on this trip. Myself, my buddy Kyle, and two of our friends, Jared and John. Kyle and I had done seven teacups the year before. Jared and John had not done it. So the first day, we split up. Uh, Kyle wanted to do this lesser run canyon called Peppermint Creek. So Kyle and I said, okay, we'll go to Peppermint Creek. Jared and John, you guys go meet up. They met up with Freddie's group, who was running seven teacups. So we split ways that morning. Kyle and I went to do Peppermint Creek. Jared and John went with the bigger group to do seven teacups. We got to the very last rappel. I didn't see an anchor. So I was pulling out webbing to make an anchor wrap around a tree, a pretty bomber tree. And Kyle said, wait, let's check the beta. The beta specifically said not to use that giant bomber tree, but to use this little, like, shrub tree because it said that way you can go through the water course. The tree it told us to use was about the same size as the tree we used for the previous rappel. So I thought, all right, well, fuck it. Right. It says it, it in the beta. The, it worked the first time. Yeah, it yeah. worked the first time. It says it in the beta. So so the last rappel is 100 feet. It's like a 40-foot slopey downhill to a sheer vertical 60-foot drop. And the first 10 feet of that is overhanging. I got down to the overhanging part, and rather than kind of inverting on the rappel and walking slowly, I tried to do like SWAT team style jump down to a ledge below. Well, as I jumped, the anchor just shot out of the ground, roots and everything. I went back a year later, because we were estimating from pictures we had seen of it and just trying to figure out. I mean, we figure first it was like 20 feet, then 30 feet. I went back on my one year anniversary to finish it with another group of guys it was at least 50 feet and and free fall (laughs) and I I, the last thing I remember was I do distinctly remember the rope giving and screaming at Kyle thinking that he had meat anchored in but he because it was on a slopey downhill there was no way he could have braced himself in a meat anchor so anchor shot out of the ground I fell, and a giant rescue operation ensued. I still don't really know how it all worked out. So Kyle was stuck up without a rope or an anchor, so somehow he heroically climbed around the rim to the adjacent cliff side and down climbed down that to me. So, uh, apparently, I was conscious during this, and screaming and yelling i i have like three or four very brief snapshots and that's all i remember come in blackout come in moment yeah I, i i remember waking up at the bottom of the canyon and feeling agonizing pain <laughs> what did what did you land on did you land on boulders or did you land on something relatively flat oh no i was rocks so you landed Just straight on rocks. jagged rocks yeah and, and at this time, too, remember, this was the worst ski season on record. So normally there might have been some water down there to dampen my fall. It was a trickle at this point. So it was no such luck. The damage done, I shattered both heels, both ankles. I had an open compound fracture to my tibia and fibia on my right leg. Open book fracture of my pelvis, meaning my pelvis completely snapped in half. Broken hand, dislocated thumb, and lacerations, like, all over me. And I was apparently half in water, which, like, 50 degrees snow runoff, which is also a problem. So somehow Kyle heroically down-climbed to me, and I guess he tried to move me. He said it, He said in, like, 10 minutes he literally moved me, like, two inches, I guess because I was in such a... Did you get out of the water? Or? Trying to get me out of the water into a sunny spot where he could leave me because he didn't want to leave me in the water but I guess I was just in too much pain to allow him to move me so then he says he took his suit off and ran and said he had to run again I do remember him trying to leave me several times and me saying no 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 don't this is like really fuzzy recollection 
I remember getting placed on that backboard, but I don't, I don't remember seeing anything. I just remember hearing, hey, we're here, we're trying to rescue you, blah, blah, blah. But I I don't remember. Do you do you know how the word got out? Do you have, so, do you have a so device? Kyle, so Peppermint Creek uh, abuts next to this weird private property line. We think it's U.S. Forest Service land because they have a bunch of weird machinery and satellite dishes and all this weird stuff out there. Kyle scrambled back up the egress, which is really fucking steep, by the way, and long. Uh, I I still don't know how he did this. Um, he scrambled up that and ran into this private property area uh, that we're supposed to avoid out of right. deference, but but now he's... Um, and there just happened to be people there who apparently had walkie-talkies directed to the forest ranger. So they called the, fo- the forest ranger. They tried to call search and rescue, but the helicopter was too far away so then they had to get the sheriff's department, and I think Tulare County, to come out and rescue me. And the helicopter was so small, they had to leave the search and rescue guys in the canyon while they took me to the hospital <laughs> <laughs> and go back and pick them up. So the whole ordeal took, we're guessing, like around four hours, which under the circumstances is... is a very long time. So um, I learned this in my studies hypothermia is defined as a core temperature of 95 degrees or below and they told me when I got to the hospital my core temp was 90 um I was on like the verge of death this was the scariest time of my life so now now remember I'm completely fucked up and I'm on drugs so they (laughs) I kept at I, I I and then the next snapshot I remember was was waking up in the ER or wherever I was, uh, and I kept asking, and it's like a freight train. You you th- you think it's a dream. You hope it's a dream. Please let this be a dream. Please let this be a dream. Please let me wake up. But you're waking into the reality you're trying to escape right, from. So you're it is actually it waking is into something awful. worse. Yes. Than, okay. <laughs> it is the worst feeling ever. And I've had that feeling before because I've woken up in the hospital being like, no, no, please, 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 not again, please, not again. And now here we are awake. So um, when I woke up, I kept asking, where am I? What happened? And I keep saying you had a climbing accident. Now, at the time, I know there's a very small difference between canyoneering and climbing, but at the time, I'm thinking, okay, is this the canyoneering trip? I think I might have been on because right. I can't remember that well right. or is this sometime in the distant future where I've taken up climbing and I have no <laughs> fucking idea what decade it is so that was problem number one and you've had amnesia before yeah. so this wouldn't be a new experience so that was too. problem number one then they then they kept saying stop talking or we'll have to put the tube back in <laughs> because I guess they intubated me but at the time I thought Oh no, they gave me a tracheotomy and now I'm like smoker lady. Right. Okay, and then they put this thing on and it went right over my nose like that. Then I was thinking, oh my God, I had a climbing accident. I ripped my face off and now I have Michael Jackson nose. <laughs> so for two days, I was thinking I had a tracheotomy. My face was disfigured <laughs> and I kept asking and my mom was there. So I was like, Mom, am I disfigured? She was like, no, honey, you're beautiful. I was like, I don't believe you. You're my mom. <laughs> You'd say that no matter what I look like. So finally I get, like, wheeled out, and I'm, like, finally looking at my body for the first time. It's It felt like it felt so... The way I felt was how Neo must have felt when he woke up from the Matrix. It's like, what is all this in my body? This is weird. Why are these things on my leg? Um, <laughs> Spoilers for the Matrix. Yeah, the, the guy comes in. He's like, "We did this. We fixed it. We fixed it. We fixed it." I was like, "Am I disfigured?" And he was like, "Someone give this guy a mirror." I thought I was, <laughs> "Oh, thank God! At least I still got my money maker." I'm all. <laughs> it was, uh, it was rough, man. And all of this was two, about two years ago today. I'm still getting all these Facebook notifications, and it's pretty surreal oh yeah facebook likes to remind you of everything including this right 
So we haven't even talked about the amputation yet. <laughs> no, we haven't gotten to that. So spoilers for the future of this yeah, podcast. Yeah, spoilers for the future. So how long were you in the hospital since you broke so many things? You clearly had to be there for a while. Did you need surgery? I imagine oh, as well. Fourteen surgeries. surgeries 14. I had. I was there for five weeks. Okay. Long time. I shattered my foot. They tried to repair everything the first two days I was there, except for my heels, because they said there was so much trauma, they were flayed open, is the word they use. And they were pulverized, and they had to wait for the swelling to go down. So they were able to do heel reconstructive surgery on my left foot, but there was more trauma to my right, and I had the open compound fracture. Is the idea that you probably landed on your heels first? So, I know your, your listeners can't see what I'm doing, but um, I think because of what happened with my pelvis, mm-hmm. I think I landed and hooked one leg and just kind of got okay. s- got snapped in half gotcha. as I fell, I think. <laughs> you know, there's no way of knowing for sure. Right. They did the heel reconstructive surgery on my left foot. They tried for the right the swelling hadn't gotten down enough, so they wanted to wait a couple days. Then they checked it again, and at that time we found that the open compound fracture that they tried to sew back up had ruptured. It's called dehissing, which basically means the skin was too traumatized, so it just died. So if you see the pictures of it, it's black. So it's like, all the skin severe. is necrotic. Yeah. It's just completely shriveled up and dead. And that was kind of the death sentence for my foot, because there's... The last ditch effort there was to try to do this flap surgery, they call it, which is basically a form of plastic surgery where they take a graft of skin, which I b- think they took from my, th- I think they took it from my thigh, and put it over the wound and try to get your body to grow back together, and that failed. By that time, so much time had passed that they could no longer do any heel uh, reconstructive work on the bone. So at that point, my only option for any bone surgery would have been to have a full ankle fusion, which would have meant all of my bones and my foot would have been fused. So it basically would have been like a Lego man foot. Like my foot and leg would have been all one piece. I'd have no articulation in the ankle whatsoever. And when they first told me that, my knee-jerk response was I'd rather have a prosthetic leg. I didn't know anything about prosthetics at this point, but... I knew they can run. I knew they can go to the Olympics. I knew they do a bunch of stuff. And I knew I couldn't do anything with a fused foot. The doctor's response was, well, you may want to think about that someday, but you don't have to make that decision today. Which was probably a wise thing for him to say. Yeah. Very early on, it was something I realized I would probably have to consider um so while i was in the hospital i started researching the hell out of it i i have i have a a word file of like medical notes i took that's like 60 pages long i mean i researched every athlete what company they're sponsored by what foot they use in what sports uh what the benefits were where to get this stuff you're thinking about having to lose your leg but your mind is thinking how can I still function and still do these things I like to do? Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> so once the plastic surgery failed, then it was kind of like, well, if I was going to keep my foot, I would have had to first have this super gnarly microvascular plastic surgery just to close up the wound. Then I would have had to have a fused ankle. So I figured, well, if I need plastic surgery, I might as well be back in Los Angeles and get me the hell out of Bakersfield because I've been here way too long. Moved back to my parents' place. Fortunately, they had a vacation home down in Dana Point, and that's where I basically did my rehab down there in their house, which is a whole story in and of itself, um, because they were living in Texas at the time, so that put a huge burden on them. I love you, Mom. I love you, Dad. (laughs) So we came back, and my goal at that point was to, you know, get a second, third, fourth opinion to see if it's possible to save my foot without having a fusion. Is it possible to piece it back together? What I have to do? I worked my way up the totem pole, man. I started at UCI, then went to USC, and then went to Cedar sinai And he took it to a panel of international experts, and they all said the same thing. So then I started 
talking to a bunch of guys from Challenge Athlete Foundation and doing a bunch of research on people with fusions to try to see what their, you know, compare the capabilities. Basically made my decision, all right, I'd, I'd rather amputate. And my doctor said, all right, I'm not going to let you do that until you write me a letter explaining why. I said, okay. So I did. It's like seven pages long. And I remember sending it to him, and his response was, you're ready. And I was like, oh, shit. (laughs) (laughs) Shit just got real. (laughs) Um, It was rough, though, man, because I had to wait another two months before surgery. So it was kind of like just waiting out this execution. And I'm assuming the rest of your body hasn't healed either. Well, so I was discharged with a hole the size of a softball on my heel that we had to change the dressing on twice a day i mean it was all the way down to the tendon you could my tendon completely exposed so i'm looking at this foot that's basically already dead every day and it's the weirdest thing the the only thing i compare it to is almost like like having a dog that you have to put down it's like it's not only that it's that i'm cutting off a part of my body but that I'm the one doing it it's right. like I'm the one deciding to, to kill this thing and it's it's really it's yeah, I mean I mean to back. say it's hard obviously it's hard but it's it, um, my mom had a had breast cancer and had a mastectomy and I I'd imagine that's worse I think this gives me a little bit of that same kind of it's something taken from you it's a part of you you know it's been with you your whole life it's pretty hard but what was what was really the turning point for me in making that decision was similar to the canyonary community the community of amputee athletes are fucking chargers they will charge harder than 99% of the rest of society Um, So I was like, you know what? I'm in good hands. This is going to be hard going through this, but I know when I come out the other side, I've got a huge support network. And that was huge. That was a big factor in uh, the decision. So I did that September 21st, 2015. Same year. Been working at getting back since then. So so tell me what that day was like, because the day you wake up and you know that's what's happening, it's a different day than all the other days leading up to it. Yeah, so I was actually just telling my girlfriend about this, Sherry. Hello. So I had this special procedure done during surgery called an IPOP. It stands for Immediate Post-Operative Prosthesis. They fit a, basically a cosmetic just temporary prosthetic leg to the end of the cast. So when you get out of surgery, you actually have a foot. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, I mean, they're mainly psychological, but there's a lot of reasons they do that, um, or that technique exists. I remember getting out of surgery and not even realizing it was over because I had a foot there. (laughs) And I was like, when are they, when are they going to roll me into surgery? And mom was like, Oh, it's done. You just got out. I said, what? Really? To be honest, man, it was, it was a relief to, to, once it was finally over because I was in so much pain on, our, and my foot was so disfigured. I mean, it was one of, one of the most in, encouraging things um, that I remember to this day. A guy I was talking to, George Lara, uh, who I'm still friends with on Facebook. Um, he had a fusion first and two years later ended up amputating so his opinion was very important to me because he went through both of the things I was considering and he told me he was like yeah there's still days I miss my foot he was like but I have to remind myself I miss my foot before the accident (laughs) after the accident it was already gone and that's kind of how I felt once I finally had the amputation I was like you know what I can't change what, what was already done and what I had was was gone already. Have, have you ever regretted it since, or does it always feel like it was the right decision? No, I never. Like I said, man, th- dealing with this was easier than dealing with knee surgery. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, <laughs> a, a, I mean, a bigger adjustment, but a, a much quicker recuperation period. I mean, it's kind of like you get it, and yeah, it's rough the first couple months, but every day is better. 
I mean, I'm still learning how to use it, but it's cool. I got a whole bunch of new gear now. <laughs> <laughs> so now you can be a gear it junkie. Looks about badass. Your, about your People leg come too. up and ask me questions. <laughs> I get in pretty much anywhere I want to get into. <laughs> it's like a, the VIP card. Regret's a hard thing, you know. I mean, even even the canyon itself. You know, if I were to go back, would I have done things differently? Yeah, but you know, I wonder. Well, if this happened on that canyon. Did this save me from dying? Right, something another worse one. elsewhere. Yeah, I don't know. it's it's. There are probably no more than three things in my life that I. I was gonna say that I regret. You're into air is human. You're gonna make mistakes. It really matters if if you you learn from them and going back and changing what you did in the past. I don't know. What are the things you think you learned from this? Still learning. (laughs) (laughs) Well, so for our listening viewers out there, um, my injuries didn't stop there. (laughs) Oh, no. Oh, no. They did not. So that's been the biggest thing I've been really, really trying to investigate and understand is, is I feel like every injury I've had has a fairly logical explanation. In hindsight, I understand why it happened. Was it the result of extreme negligence? I don't think any of them were the result of extreme negligence at the time. Were mistakes made? Sure. But they fairly, the mistakes were small. The consequences consequences were big. (laughs) But for me, what's weird is that, like, even though any one accident has a reasonable explanation, it's the the series of repeated accidents that, that's unsettling to me and and how do I deal with that and is this just an inherent part of these activities and if it is why is it happening to me and not other people but maybe it is happening to other people I mean, I've been looking into the stats a lot like for stuff like snowboarding it's it's a hard thing to compare because most of the athletes are really young and if they get really injured I mean, the lifespan of a professional snowboarder is very short. It's like a gymnast, you know. It's like five years and then done. Unless you're Sean White, which nobody's Sean White. Sean White, Tony Hawk, they're kind of like giants that change the entire sport. Other than them, it's just a bunch of bros trying to make it for five years, and then they'll get a real job. Or they'll be in the industry long term, but it's you know, unless you're really in the sport, you don't know about them too much. The point is that... I think my story is not uncommon. I just think you don't hear about it as often because extreme sports aren't mainstream. Now, the Kenyan is an extreme sport, but outdoor sport. It's it's not going to get the same sort of press as football or baseball or basketball. But I don't know, man. I mean, it's (laughs) I I don't want to get injured and ever again. Why does it keep happening? I mean, a certain aspect of it is luck, but or bad luck, but a certain aspect is not, that part's hard. (laughs) I mean, I'm sure it's a question everybody asks when you go out and do something that's inherently dangerous, that, you know, even if the risk is low, the consequences are so high, you still have to make that evaluation. And being honest with myself, the ADHD impulsivity thing is probably at play. I might... I still think all of the risks I've taken have been calculated in my mind, but for whatever reason, my risk threshold is higher than I would like it to be. (laughs) In the past, I was willing to accept that because the consequences were lower. Like, you know, I, I overshoot a table, break my arm, sprain a wrist, blow out my thumb or whatever. Whatever. You'll deal with that. You'll heal from it death loss of limbs not so much (laughs) so yeah man i mean there's literally not a day that goes by that i have not thought about this and and honestly now i think it's the girl girlfriend that's gonna part of part of it might be being a single guy i think i was doing it uh um just charge 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 just kind of go 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 as fast as you can Sherry's super rad because she's so into outdoors and the outdoor stuff. 
climbing, cycling, all that canyoneering, all that stuff independently. But it's something we can do together, and I enjoy it just being with her. Which is different than enjoying it when you're with guy friends. Because when you're with the guy friends, there's still just like, go, go, go. Or when you're with a girl, it's more you enjoy experiencing it together. I think that's going to be the thing that saves me, (laughs) honestly. Um, Save me from myself, baby. (laughs) God knows I can't do it. I have not taken this lightly. But I I can't give up this lifestyle either. I, I, I... it's what I want. It's what I want to give to my kids. It's what how I want to spend time with the people I love. It's <laughs> it's amazing. It's funny because I do think there are a lot of people who maybe if they if they don't participate in these kinds of things or if they don't have a thing that they just have this kind of passion about, they'd say, "Well, you lost your leg. Now you're going to stop all that stuff, right?" Not realizing what that would mean is you lose more than I, one thing. You yes. lose your leg and then the thing that you, you love. Your life. Yeah. Yeah. That was one thing I put in my letter. I said I'm I'm more committed to my lifestyle than my leg. And if I'm going to have to sacrifice one, I'd rather give up a part of my body but be able to continue living life on my own terms. Easier said than done. I think I said that in one of my messages. I said, well, I've made the decision. <laughs> Now, following through with it right. is, is the hard part. So you said it's been about two years now, right? Yeah. May 9th, 2015. So Today is the 18th? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Was... I was still in the hospital two years ago today, that's for sure. So what has it looked like post-healing or, or just been... once you're able to function again? So that's been... You asked me earlier uh, what I've learned from it, and I didn't really give a precise answer because there's too many things, and the things are also far too elusive to put into words. But one of the things I've learned is patience, which is not one of my virtues. (laughs) Perseverance. Also not saying that I'm good at that. I've gotten injured before. Um, I've had setbacks before. I've taken time off from sports before and come back. Never like this. I'm trying to think of an example. You know, it's like, oh, I've been off for two years. I I can't throw double backflips anymore to, oh, I just lost my leg and literally can't walk to the toilet. It is, hum- <laughs> it has been very humbling. What's been encouraging but also a huge learning process is starting from a place that is so much farther away from my goal than I have ever been and seeing the progress so much slower than it's ever been in the past. I would like to believe that that translates into strength and more, you know, like, but it is taxing. Kind of dealing with that day to day, you know, keep... (laughs) It's a mile away, and I'm one inch closer. And now I'm another inch, another inch. Yeah, I imagine it's got to be a kind of frustration you never had to deal with yes, before. Yes, yes. Through that, I've also seen that it does come back. And in with the people I've met, definitely exposed me to a world that I had no knowledge of before. What about other people? How have they been since it happened? I'm sure when something like this happens to you, you start to learn things about people. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, I've seen the outreach when this all happened is still something that blows my mind to this day. I saw the best of humanity. I mean, it still moves me uh, that that many people cared, that many people gave and supported me. and I got to know my parents in a way that I don't think ever would have been possible in this life. I talked a little bit about that in some of my posts, but it's weird when you're a kid, you're kind of inherently narcissistic and because you don't you don't know anything different. Like I'm hungry, like you have to feed me. Like what else is going to happen? You're not consciously aware of their sacrifices. Uh, you're completely oblivious to it actually. This time I saw the pain. I was I I I received all of this love and care, but with a much different understanding. And that was beyond humbling to see, you know, 
I should be at a point where I'm caring for my parents and these people who, you know, raised me are catering to my every need just to keep me alive. Um, it's a very humbling experience. I think we, we became closer than we ever would have been if this hadn't have happened. And that's one of, one of the things that I take away from this, that, that we have this relationship now that's very special. So yeah, that's people. People can be awesome. I mean, we could probably go on I know, forever I know. <laughs> about this, but I think we've really hit some of the important stuff here. I know that during the process, you were posting things to Facebook and, and you had the GoFundMe page and things. If there was somewhere people wanted to go to either see, read about that process, is there a place online for that? Oh. Or just a place where they could see happier days from your life? Everyone tells me I need to write a book and trust me, it's on my list, but it's taken a while. I mean, to see happier days, Facebook, public to the world, <laughs> you can see that. My firm website. Uh, ironically, the, the pictures on my firm website were literally taken like a week before the accident happened. Oh, really? Yeah. Isn't it pictures of like you and ski slopes and things yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah. It was taken by my, my old roommate, it's friend. Good, it's a good thing you didn't put those off. <laughs> I know, seriously. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I was I was charging really hard. I finally felt like I was really like figuratively and literally getting my feet back under me. And then... Uh, <laughs> End of February this year, completely blow out my knee, dislocated, torn PCL and LCL. And that was skiing, right? That was skiing. So now I'm back on the couch again for sounds another like, 10 months this like time. Sounds like a good time to write a book. I know. But being in the hospital for another couple of weeks and then... Like I said, man, dealing with this in many ways has been more complicated than the amputation. So it's it's been rough, man. I'm... Better days are coming. I got a smoking hot girlfriend, and that keeps me happy. <laughs> Better days are coming when we'll both be doing active stuff. But um, these two years have been trying. <laughs> They've really, really gone through the fire. It's really nice to be surrounded in such a cool community of like-minded people. Man, I know that they'll be there when I come back. It'll give me plenty of time to make sure this never happens again. <laughs> think through every possible contingency so before we do go ahead and wrap this up is there any final thought you want to share i don't know if you can trust me with words of wisdom right now <laughs> it doesn't have to be words of wisdom it's just whatever whatever you want to leave people I mean, with i could say hashtag ej law but that's sh shameless <laughs> self-promotion i was gonna say love your family that's the first thing i could think of we just got talking about people right before this and it makes me think of my folks and how much they gave through this whole experience. And ironically, as much pain as I put my parents through, none of this would have happened if my dad just let me snowboard. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of like this big uh, reciprocal thing. <laughs> it's funny. That takes us all the way back to the beginning yeah, of this discussion. Yeah, see, see how I did that? <laughs> I, think we, I think we could happily end this with two great thoughts. Love your family. Let your kids snowboard. <laughs> oh, man. Just don't let them rollerblade. That was a huge mistake. <laughs> well, shit, man. Uh, thanks for meeting me. Yeah. Thanks for sitting thank down you. to do this. I, I know it's it. probably not the easiest stuff to talk about. No, but I've done a lot, so I can, <laughs> I can kind of tune out and just go on tangents for a while, which happened a lot, obviously. It's dark outside now. Yeah, well, hopefully that knee gets better soon and... We'll see some photos of you doing cool shit again. Thanks, man. Yeah. I appreciate it. So if you haven't heard enough about Eric Johnson's injuries, and perhaps you'd like to hear more about some fresh injuries he has experienced in this year, 2017, do not fret. We have show favorite Erica here to read to us in Eric Johnson's own words what exactly is going on in his life these days. As far as an update, what we did not discuss in my interview is my new injuries of this last year. 
January 28th. While doing a photo and drone shoot up at Mount Baldy this last winter, I caught an edge and slid through two rock croppings. Not big enough to be a cliff, but definitely big enough to scare the shit out of me. Going face first into a narrow rock riddled chute, somehow I flipped myself around to ensure I would land feet and not face first and was able to ski away. A few seconds later, I thought, hmm, my finger kind of hurts. And I looked at my finger and it was sideways. That night, I went to the hospital and confirmed via x-ray that it was broken. Not just broken, it was shattered. Medical term, comminuted, meaning splintered. Thanks to my connections at Cedar sinai I got on the fast track with a renowned hand surgeon who was to perform surgery the following week. However, I had scheduled a trip to Washington to climb Mount St. Helens and ski down with Sherry Lister. The surgeon told me after surgery, I could not do anything active for six to eight weeks meaning I could not do anything that made me sweat. So on the morning of surgery, I declined surgery, primarily so I could keep skiing uninterrupted through the winter, and also so it wouldn't change any plans I had with Sherry. Ha ha! So I declined surgery to keep skiing. Then three weeks later, February 23rd, after having one of the best ski days of my life, about 100 yards from the car on the last run of the day, I crossed my tips, flew over the handlebars, and completely blew out my knee. I looked down and my left leg was sideways. Specifically, I had a complete dislocation of my knee, complete tear of PCL and partial tear of LCL. I was carried off the hill in a toboggan and was in Mammoth Hospital for three days. I called my surgeon from Cedar and he contacted his buddy, renowned sports medicine surgeon at USC, Dr. Greg Rick Hatch, surgeon for USC, LA Lakers, etc., they put me on the fast track for surgery, and I underwent surgery on March 7th at USC. LCL repair and PCL reconstruction with allograph, i.e. cadaver donor tissue, augmentation and internal brace, 10 plus month recovery. So a major bummer. I've been slowly recovering from that time, but it's been a long taxing experience. But sometime, despite all this, I simultaneously started up a really serious relationship with my dream girl, Sherry Lister, who actually just drove down from Seattle and is moving all her stuff into my apartment as we speak. Ha <laughs> ha! And now it is that time, time to run to your internet device of choice. Head to the website, gogetoutside.com slash podcast. Look for episode 52 with Eric Johnson. And there you will find photographs, photographs of Eric in action with his prosthetic leg and photos of the recovery process. So be prepared. But that's not all you'll find there. You'll also find links to ejohnsonlaw.com, his Facebook page, his YouTube page, where you can see multiple videos about his recovery process, including when his cast first came off and he saw his amputated leg for the first time. And also a link to a Beach Reporter article about his accident in Peppermint Creek. And while you are there on your internet machine, how about sending us a message here at the show? Go at ButcherBirdStudios.com or give us a call. 818-925-0106. You can apparently even text us there should you choose to do so. And if you would like to do us and me here at this show a big favor, run to iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, wherever the hell you get this podcast. Subscribe to the show, rate the show, review the show, share it with somebody who wants to hear a great amnesia story. Next time on the show, Leslie Kim. She's a climber, designer, illustrator, and the force behind Dynamite Starfish. Come back July 16th, Leslie Kim. See you then. <laughs>